Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 142 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am joined by the show's co-host, Omar Ansari. Hey, Assalamu alaikum, Barbez, and Assalamu alaikum, listeners. We are super excited to be here with our esteemed guest, Murtaza Hussain, and we're diving right into it. Uh, Murtaza Hussain is a Brooklyn-based journalist and habitual line stepper. Uh, he's a political commentator for The Intercept, embodying the online publication's dedication to producing fearless adversarial journalism. His work focuses on human rights, foreign policy, and cultural affairs. And Murtaza's work has appeared in the New York Times, Al Jazeera English, Common Dreams, The Guardian, The Globe, and Mail, Salon, and elsewhere. His writings are also available by his Substack, which we'll be posting the link to. Uh, and of course, he is active on Twitter as well. Welcome, Murtaza. Thanks for having me. Uh, we're obviously having this conversation in wake of what is happening in Palestine. Um, and so we certainly want to get your thoughts on that. But I guess before we do that, I definitely want to learn more about your background, what sort of brought you into journalism and, and sort of the interests that you do write about. So if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. Yeah. So I've been a journalist at The Intercept for the past uh, 10 years now. And I got into journalism kind of by accident. I kind of... Uh, I had a background in something else, but I started writing on my own some years ago during the time of the Arab Spring and just before that. And I kind of got into journalism organically. I just started writing and building an audience in various platforms. And then in 2013, I was hired by The Intercept. And since then, I've been reporting on you know various different subjects, but I would say the broad theme would be foreign policy and national security. And I've had the opportunity in that work to travel all over the United States and in many countries around the world as well, too, to report on stories for The Intercept uh, related to that broad theme. And I'm still there today. So it's, it'll be 10 years. It'll, it's been 10 years in September and still going. You were saying you were in a completely different sort of field uh, and then got into journalism by accident. Um, what sort of prompted that interest besides just the love of writing, I think, that you alluded to earlier? Well, you know, obviously, after 9-11, there was a lot of uh, political pressure, especially if you were from, you say, Muslim background. Uh, broadly, there would be a lot of questions, a lot of uh, stressors that you had to deal with, and, you know, obviously, a lot of uh, scrutiny of society upon Muslim communities. So, for that reason, I always felt the, an impetus to sort of, you know, say something about this or to do something constructive, but... You know, so you don't always, we don't really have big institutions in the Muslim community for the most part. We, most people are pretty working class, or a lot of people are pretty working class at least. So, you know, we're a newer, most Muslim immigrants, you know, after, with the exception of African American Muslims, they are a couple of generations here. A lot of them, like I said, they're working class. They don't really have the ability to go straight into media and do things like that, or even politics. So, you know, you just have to kind of get by to survive. So I wasn't really in a position to, you know, take an internship at the New York Times or something like that. Uh, and with no, for no money or, you know, whatever else people do to get their usually foot in the door in journalism. So I just did it a different way. I just, uh, you know, I moonlighted as a journalist. I just kind of reported stories in my spare time. I kept a day job, various different things just to pay the bills. Uh, traveled on my own and did stories, you know, just went on, take some time off and took off for a bit to do some reporting. That type of thing. Very, very working class journalism and writing. Uh, because I felt that the post 9-11 climate was such that people should respond to it in some way. And journalism was an effective way uh, to do so. So that was kind of the start of doing it. And I was fortunate in that, you know, people, some number of people like my journalism, like my writing. And I built a following from it. And I got to know people who were in journalism who were somehow impressed or somehow liked what I was writing. And eventually, those connections helped me, put me in a position where I started doing it full-time. And now, today, I'm doing it full-time at quite a high level for quite some time. Now, most of my adult life, I could say. Yeah. So, that's kind of how I got into journalism that way, sort of through the back door. Without, I always wanted to be a journalist, but I didn't really see it realistic to do it full-time, per se. But then, I managed to do it anyways just by kind of uh, insisting upon it. That's 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 pretty cool that you you followed your passion and and uh, it realized it just through consistency and hard work. That's that's great to hear. Um, you know, you talked about your youth a bit, and just taking a look at some of your your work, you talk about First Amendment, freedom freedom of speech. You also talk about a lot of geopolitical issues ranging from India, India, Pakistan to of course Israel. 
were those topics and, and issues you were passionate about from, from an early age? Yeah, of course. Uh, those issues definitely, uh, you know, especially against Israel Palestine because, uh, so resonant and relevant to, uh, living in the West, especially, you know, yeah, in or near the United States. So yeah, I always, always, always cared about those issues, always took an interest in them. And, you know, I think that for the average person, uh, I'll say most people, you don't really have time to devote your whole life to studying it in intricate nuance and detail. You just have kind of a high level takeaway of what's going on, what you think is happening, and you just work with that. But, uh, you know, I was just very keenly interested and in invested in it, so I always kept uh, reading up on it. Of course, India, Pakistan as well, too, and many other issues besides that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I try to always be abreast of what's going on to some degree in the world, and especially in the Muslim world, and continue to maintain that interest. And I've been so fortunate that I can write a bit about it now and travel some of these places periodically when the, the news calls for it. Yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of, how how I came out. I always had interest in it and I developed it and still developing over time. I want to definitely delve into talking about the Palestinian issue, but I guess before that, just staying on the topic of media a little bit longer, I don't think it's lost on anyone that, you know, the media landscape has become so tribal, um, much like our politics, much like I think a lot of other issues. I guess within that sort of tribal media landscape, um, you being at the intercept, which I think generally speaking, people view as sort of, um, you know, it, it's hard to sort of put it on that spectrum, if you will, um, you know, whether it's like a liberal media or a conservative media. I, I would love to sort of get your thoughts on just sort of your assessment of that media landscape and the sort of tribal nature and, and where you think the intercept fits within that spectrum. Sure, I think the popular perception of the intercept is more that it's kind of left leaning, and uh, I think that's probably true for the most part. But uh, you know, the people who have a relatively broad range of views who also work there, so I don't think that uh, it's particularly constraining. And I think that most of all, people, and I think this goes for any news outlet, this should be the most important thing, is that they value professionalism and accuracy uh, above ideological considerations. Everyone has a worldview. And it's probably better to be transparent about your worldview, all things considered, because I don't think anyone is truly uh, neutral per se. Everyone looks at things from a certain perspective. But that should not be the overriding factor of concern or characteristic of your reporting if you're a reporter. Uh, it should be focusing on veracity, uh, professionalism, uh, correspondent truths. And what I mean by that is you know, reporting and uh, disclosing thing, events accurately as they take place. So those things, I think, are more most important. And I think The Intercept, you know, have lots of great colleagues and people who are really passionate about their work and passionate about uh, certain causes. But I know that, above all, they'll never stretch the truth or they'll never report something which is not true uh, in the service of ideology. They put their professionalism as reporters about everything else. And I think that that's the most important factor. And that's what I look for in other reporters and other news outlets, more so than ideological rectitude. So, yeah, while I'd say the intercept is kind of left leaning, I would think that, I would think that the tribalism is kind of, uh, it's a bit, uh, toxic because, you know, you want just to know the truth, first of all, and then you can make your own mind, your mind up from that and change your mind as time right. allows. But because of this tribal, uh, atmosphere, you know, a lot of outlets, unfortunately, are becoming more ideological and less focused on professionalism. And I think that's a big problem in the media landscape today. Well, we're moving the conversation uh, to what's happening right now in Palestine. It's fair to assume, I mean, I, I don't think I'm being biased here in saying that when we look at mainstream media, uh, there's certainly a pro-Israel, Israeli bent. And I think that what we have seen different this time around is the advent of social media and the influence that social media is having on that. But I guess just sticking to or an analysis of the mainstream media, first of all, would you agree that that's generally been the case? Generally, reporting is favorable to Israel. And then what do you see different happening now? Uh, not only vis-a-vis social media, but let's say even some of the more mainstream channels. Yeah, and, and real quick on that, it's, it's interesting because we're in, obviously in the Muslim community, we're in a major bubble, right? And we, a- anecdotally, we've seen a shift even um, in our circles 
but is that really is that shift really even more than a drop in the ocean in the big scheme of things what shift are you referring to the shift to support you know um support gaza support palestinians a bit more among among youth muslims being more vocal the marches but Mm -hmm. i but i kind of question whether or not uh is that just my own bubble yeah uh it's hard to say because i do think that young people seem to be more favorable to the palestinian perspective on the conflict and certainly you know i think that the the perspective that the older generations you could say had uh baby boomers and the generation X for the most part, uh, it was particularly almost uniquely favorable towards Israel. They had like almost like an obsession, emotional attachment towards Israel. A lot of people did at least disproportionately people did. And that's strange to have this sort of intense attachment to a foreign country quite far away in the world. Uh, yeah. oftentimes people with no religious or cultural or ethnic tie to it would just kind of have this reflexive, support towards it in the United States. And, you know, that's definitely a product of uh, post-World War II realities and the Holocaust, the memory of that and so forth. Uh, But also, I mean, I think far more decisively and importantly, uh, really intense and successful propagandization on the subject around that time period when people people were coming of age and at a time when there was pretty much a one-sided narrative of the situation. You didn't hear from Palestinians too much or Arabs too much, or Muslims too much in the United States. Uh, people who were partisans of Israel kind of had the full, complete uh, atten- audience attention at that time. They had the whole stage to themselves. And that's not the case anymore. Like, there are a lot of uh, Arabs and Muslims and Palestinians specifically who make media, who are in the public limelight, who live in American society just normally and have coworkers, friends, and know people. And, you know, those people, they can't be ignored or demonized the way they have been in the past or treated as they're irrelevant to the situation. So I think that that change demographically is in itself produced this outcome where people, especially younger generations, are, you know, if they're not fanatically pro-Palestinian, they at least have a nuanced perspective on the subject. And they're not fanatically pro-Israel by that token. Um, yeah. it, and that, that change can feel quite dramatic. But really, it's what we should expect. It's a kind of a return to a more normal perspective on the conflict, uh, which hopefully, you know, in the long term can manifest in some changes in policy as well. Yeah. And, and I think to Omar's point about like living in a bubble, I mean, I, I, I push back generally on that a little bit, just only because what we've seen with regards to almost every weekend, the amount of protests that are happening worldwide, mm-hmm. major protest. I mean, two weeks ago, we saw a protest in Washington, D.C., which was, I think 300,000 plus we've never seen that. So I think, you know, this, you know, it's, it's not so much, I don't think a Muslim bubble anymore. I think that has become like kind of what Murtoza was saying as well, generally more, not only acceptable, but generally something we're seeing a lot more of with regards to a pro-Palestinian perspective. But I I guess uh, specifically, you know, if we can talk about social media for a little bit, I think that generally speaking, like if we look at Gen Z, um, certainly, but also, you know, Generation Alpha, they consume a lot of social media. And frankly, a lot of what they gather with regards to their perspective or what shapes their worldview is from TikTok and from YouTube and maybe Twitter. But I I think that perspective has changed as well. And I think that the content creators out out there who are speaking with a pro-Palestinian voice, that's certainly been the case. And we've seen a lot more of that than we did, like you said, a few years ago. Do you kind of see that shift happening with regards to not only where people are consuming um, their news, but also, you know, that informing the kind of perspective shift that we've seen? I think it's a huge, uh, it's a huge aspect of it because, you know, when there are only a few media channels, uh, you can control them. You right. Can- have a lot of control, you know, downstream of that and um, everyone's understanding of the world period. And what you've seen now is I would say like a decentralization of media. So there are more media channels you can count now technically. There are more social media accounts. There are more right. YouTube channels. There are more, you know, Discord and Telegram and God knows what. Right. So you can't really control the narrative anymore. You can't uh, have two or three major TV networks and as long as, or newspapers, and as long as you're on good terms with the editors there and you manage your relationship with them, then you can control everyone thinks. 
uh, that world is seem I think is over for good now. Yeah, I'd love. And to- when that's the case, yeah, go ahead. no, 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 keep going. Now, finish your thought, please. Yeah, no, I was going to say that you know when that's the case, uh, you have to deal with public opinion and much more unvarnished and you know a more rowdy public opinion and a more a broader spectrum of opinion. Yeah, and also very crucially, you can't cut in this case Palestinians out. You can't cut them out of the system. They have just as much ability to open a YouTube channel or a Twitter account as anybody else and talk to the world as anybody as just anyone else can. So, you know, in reality, that's a big change. And that's a significant revolutionary change because it means that, you know, young people who never had all those years of indoctrination watching CBS or CNN or whatever it is, you know, they're just getting information from in ways that no one can control. No one can really, you know, clip or... Curate. Curate. Maybe curate. The that's the word. Maybe yeah. They, yeah, they can't curate their news consumption the way they've been done in the past. So I think that interestingly, you know, they should put a lot more pressure on the Israeli government and partisans of Israel to find a sustainable and permanent solution to the problem. Because every time there's a conflict, you know, violence flares up in Israel, Palestine, it is right now very acutely. Uh, you're going to have people talking about the subject in ways you can't control. Mm-hmm. And if you can't control it, you're going to have a lot of unfavorable things said or disseminated about you uh, inevitably, especially if you're the party which is killing more people, as this case Israel is. It's not a sustainable situation anymore. Like They could sustain a long-term conflict when they control information, but I think that yeah. now that they can't control it, they really should consider taking a serious effort to ending it. And, and just double downing on that on that conversation about the media evolving. Like On one hand, you're right, there's like literally millions of channels, right? Every Every Twitter handle, every websites the channel um and those new voices are posting videos that just can't be con- contained on the flip side you hear about major me- new news outlets not being able to use certain words like genocide um ethnic cleansing what- whatever whatever the terms are we've heard that can't be used and then there's again there's always flip side to the flip side you have journalists that signing you know signing a uh, an open letter as well uh, protesting those um, so that censorship that I just referred to, where 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 is this in the in the big scheme of things? I mean, are we just in the beginning of that kind of evolution? Like, is the old media really losing its its voice, or is or is it or is is it, is this kind of the new normal? Are we, is this where we're at? Well, you know, it's hard to say because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, technologically uh, or regulatory wise. So. You know, I don't know, but uh, I don't think they'll ever be able to put the the genie back in the bottle, per se. It'd be very difficult to, you know, exert that sort of centralized control over social media at this point because people have gotten far too used to having these decentralized media outlets. At the same time, though, sorry, I I don't mean to cut you off, but I mean, before you get too far ahead in that thought, though, um, because at the same time, you've written, for example, about like Twitter, Elon Musk, and specifically with re- with his relationship to Modi and the kind of voices and the kind of suppression that we saw in voices that were critical of Modi. I, I know you've written about that, and so I mean, I, I guess how do you, you know, how do you factor that in with with what you were discussing with not being able to put the genie back in the bottle or the sort of democratization of voices that we've seen or that, that we're experiencing right now, because at the same time. You know, tech has the ability, whether it's by algorithm or by design, right, to uh, silence or censor certain voices. Yeah, so I think they're trying to put it back in the bottle. They're definitely making an effort to do that. And I think Elon Musk buying Twitter was, in some sense, arguably an extension of that, although his supporters would say it's the opposite. Right. But, you know, it, it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult to do that. And I'm actually surprised the extent to which state control over social media has not, for the most part, succeeded in, you know, completely quelching it, mm. at least in the West. You know, in India and you know, in Iran and other countries where things are more controlled, obviously. China. The situation yeah. is, a bit, is a bit different. China, of course, uh, it's a bit different. But, you know, speaking purely in the U.S. context, I'd say that it's difficult because uh, there is the First Amendment, and this is a technology for you know enjoying the First Amendment. People, that's how people interpreted it. 
commonly as well too so you know to actually put social media under that kind of control you'd have to impose like draconian authoritarian controls almost over it and even if you control one platform even if you control twitter there's a hundred other platforms yeah. they're all not all owned by the same people some of them are fully decentralized so you, no one really controls them at all per se so you know in that sense it's kind of like playing whack-a-mole so i don't think that they'll ever really be able to control it again after the internet yeah. But I'm curious, as a journalist, uh, obviously Twitter was a massive platform. Was his was what he did in terms of purchasing Twitter and then kind of changing, you know, changing the way it was it was run, cutting cutting staff that was looking at content, and then of course the supposed um, censorship and all that's happening. Did did you see any of that play out in how you interfaced with the platform? Did it affect you in any way? Yeah, he's definitely made the platform a lot worse, I'd say. It's like harder to use. It's a lot more uh, chaotic in the sense that uh, he got rid of the blue check system, which has been replaced by a new blue check system where you just pay for one. And, yeah. you know, I think that, you know, it's kind of just made it harder to tell who's who or what's a credible source and it's created a lot of confusion, confusion in that sense. So it's, you know, it's not a great platform, to be honest, anymore. Mm-hmm. But it's still the platform people gravitate towards using when it comes to news. Yeah. So we're kind of stuck with it. And I can only hope that eventually it's sold to somebody else and they reform it and maybe return some of the old practices. Although I think it's unlikely. I don't really see that happening per se. Um, well, at least not anytime soon. But, you know, that's just, uh, that's just it. And I think he's going to probably make more changes in the future, which I would argue is probably going to be most likely negative changes. But, you know, I don't know. I think that in the absence of that, there's just no other platform that has the same, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, network effect that mm-hmm. Twitter has. All the people, all these news organizations just tend to gravitate towards it. All these reporters use it. Uh, politicians use it. A lot of ordinary people use it. Citizen journalists use it. And that's just it. That no, no attempt at replacing it has really been successful to date. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I just, just based on uh, your, the engagement level that I see from you on Twitter, um, if I were to assume that you're as active on other platforms, um, would you share my assessment of the, at least the social media la- landscape, that the, the, the pro-Palestinian voices that we're, that we're hearing, not only are they more amplified than they were in previous conflicts, but they, that like the messaging is on another level. Like, I, I feel like, you know, these voices are slick, they're competent, they're putting out excellent content. And, and maybe it's just, you know, the way I've curated what I, you know, who I engage with on that platform or on, let, let's say a couple of platforms. What I'm not seeing is the kind of that same level of sophistication coming from, say, the pro-Israeli side. Is that, is that been your experience as, as, as well? Well, you know, what I would say is that, uh, you know, a lot of pro-Israel messaging and uh, public relations, you could say, it's not very organic. It mm. has a clear, like, uh, inorganic sort of appearance to it. Ta- yeah. Talking points from um, the top down, basically. Talking points from the top down. Um, you know, clearly professional which is not really a great thing when it comes to social media because people are looking for authenticity um a lot of it is i think they have a term called hasbara which is like explaining that's right Hebrew, but yeah but you know it's kind of like taking on a pejorative term in the sense of propaganda but generally I, I how it's used it, mm-hmm. yeah like i don't see that it's very it doesn't really work on social media i would say because it's clearly inauthentic it's clearly coordinated it's clearly top down in a way and that just does not resonate with a social media driven audience uh, very well it doesn't look very good and also there are not as many numerically i would think there are not as many committedly pro-israel people as there are pro-palestinian people and i guess part of that is because uh the palestinians have tried both the israelis and palestinians have tried to internationalize their cause in various ways over the last seven decades the Israelis have tried to uh, internationalize it by bringing in evangelical Christians to the United States. Palestinians have tried to internationalize it by bringing in uh, the, at first the Arab world and then the Muslim world. 
And, you know, if you look at the, just the weight of the new, new numbers there, it's kind of a lot more on the Palestinian side, just in total number. And in social media, that's kind of like, it's a kind of a crowd based media, yeah. just a bigger crowd. So yeah. you have more and more people on that side. And I think that reflects, that resonates in the actual, what you see online. Right. And I'll say that the Palestinian people who Palestinians or a lot who are Palestinian, they don't have top-down institutions in the same way that Israel does. They don't have the same, you know, highly slick, uh, slick in a bad way, kind of uh, uh, constructed, highly organized messaging uh, platforms like that. They're just people posting. They're people posting right. their daily lives. They're posting things that make them mad or make them upset and things like that. And that just works a lot better on social media. It's more right. organic just in itself. And I think it just comes across better. And, you know, you have to also remember that this is a uh, Palestinians have been fighting against a very sophisticated adversary for seven decades on Ex- fighting politically, mm-hmm. militarily, diplomatically, uh, in the messaging war, you could say PR. So, yeah, for sure. Know, for sure. I was just about PR to go there. Just, mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like a Darwinian fitness <laughs> effect. Like they are fighting like a really fierce and committed and capable adversary. And they've gotten really good at it in that way too. They have to be, as they can Palestinians. I'll share something kind of kind of amusing. I was just uh, I was on I don't know if it was Twitter or Facebook or something this morning, and I saw an ad for Saudi tourism, <laughs> and it just reminds me no. I've ne- I've seen ads for Saudi tourism that are very like like top down yeah. uh, to, as a metaphor. I've never seen organic posts, uh, and it kind of reminds me of, of what you're describing of the, the top down kind of. Yeah talking points versus the the organic right uh, just kind of reminded me of that i can relate to what you were saying more than that and, and i wholeheartedly agree because i think i like the darwinian take on it because you know for decades now the, the voices from the palestinian side and i don't even just mean palestinian voices i just mean pro-palestinian in general have had to have been organic uh, because they didn't have this sort of state apparatus or slick apparatus behind them and i think the Israeli on the Israeli PR side, they became far too complacent on having big media, etc. Certainly, you know, politicians do the do the work for them, and so uh, yeah, I think what we're seeing now uh, is that sort of organic sort of content creators certainly, uh, you know, be able to reach a far more broader audience because they've always been, you know. It, that, that that's just the way it's been in terms of the media landscape. So I couldn't agree with you more in terms of uh, that sort of Darwinian take on why we're seeing the kind of voices we are. And I think that's uh, that's also playing out in the streets. I mean, if we're talking about record numbers of people protesting out in the streets, that that's certainly not done without the use of you know, social media. We saw this a little bit in the Arab Spring as well, right? The role that social media played galvanizing those voices. Yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, very good at getting people out in the streets, social media. It's not clear yet if it's good at accomplishing the next step of creating yeah. lasting political change because the Arab Spring Revolution didn't really do that. And yeah. nor did Occupy or a lot of other things that social media depended heavily on. Good point. Or BLM even. Mm-hmm. So I think the, the strength of social media is galvanizing people into I'll talk about a particular thing or I'll go in the streets, do something immediately, but it's much, much more ambiguous when it comes to uh, what politics really requires, which is, you know, second and third steps and coalition building. It's actually kind of acidic to that in a way. That's a really good so, point. Yeah. So where are we yeah, with, with so. those next steps? Um, obviously, like Israel has said, this is just the beginning, right? Um, and you you're seeing a bit of, public opinion sway but nothing's nothing's happening thus far in terms of a slowdown in in the in the you know the the shelling and all that so where do you see this going in the next few days and then of course weeks and months i mean right long term i just would love to hear your thoughts as to what do you what do you foresee happening as kind of in the next few innings yeah you know it's a really interesting question um you know, the Israeli officials have said from the beginning this could take months, it could take years. Some of them have said this could take 10 years. It's not really clear what that means. Uh, I think that a lot of it depends on the military progress they make inside Gaza. It seems like they are making progress every day. Um, they've advanced the center of Gaza at this point. Uh, they've not taken, as far as we can tell, that many losses. Uh, they fought in a certain way that 
preserves their own troops from harm, tends to inflict more uh, damages on the civilian population, relying on airstrikes and artillery to hit Gaza City quite indiscriminately, I would say. So, you know, they, it was said today by an Israeli official that they believe they have two or three more weeks of political space to continue the offensive. Uh, what that means is that the political pressure globally is building up such that beyond that point, the people may not support it. Their allies may not support it abroad, especially if Palestinian civilian casualties continue to rise. So, you know, with that said, they may not be able to continue to the end. They may not be able to uh, wipe out Hamas per se as they've promised to. But, you know, then again, I don't know, because their politicians have also said that they will not go back leave Gaza until that's done. But no one's clear what that means exactly. Does that mean killing every member of Hamas? That seems like an impossible goal since it's the government of Gaza for the last past decade and a half. Uh, wiping out this leadership, wiping out major battalions, that could take a longer time. So, you know, it's really, really difficult to say because a lot of it depends on what happens inside Gaza in the next few days, in the next few weeks. Mm. But I think that they will not be able to eliminate Hamas, to be honest with you. I think it would be a very, very difficult task. And if they don't have unlimited time, it's not clear if they can accomplish that task. And what's going to happen, even if you know many, many more Palestinians are killed and the entire Gaza is destroyed, which seems like it's well, well on the way to being destroyed at the moment, if Hamas survives, they're going to declare victory. Their whole victory will just be their own survival at the end of it. And I think that for Israel, actually, the survival of Hamas would be an optimal outcome in a way, mm. because what they could do is they could leave Gaza. Uh, they could leave it in control of this group, which now, because of its attack on October 7th and the killing of Israeli civilians, will be treated as a pariah, essentially, by the international community for a very, very long time. And they can leave it in control. They'll feel they'll have very little international pressure to work with it or to uh, make compromises with it in terms of how it's governed. They won't have to let Palestinian laborers into Israel anymore from Gaza. Uh, they can really isolate Gaza like never before after the end of this war if Hamas is still there. And they'll effectively have the political upper hand over them for you know a couple more generations, at least, at least Palestinians in Gaza. So if I was Israel, if I was thinking very diabolically, which I think Benjamin Netanyahu had been for many, many years before this war, he'd been supporting Hamas uh, indirectly or directly even with money and advocating for it inside the Knesset as an asset to Israel. He, uh, you know, it would losing that asset would be very painful. They'd have to put a new Palestinian, either put a new Palestinian authority in place in Gaza, which might end up being more sympathetic to the international community and then thus have a better political position vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Or they'd have to govern Gaza themselves in the occupying power, which would be very expensive, very laborious. Um, at the same time, they're trying to occupy the West Bank and also guard the northern border. It will be very stretched. It will be very bad for their economy and society to have to occupy Gaza. So I think that if I were the Israelis, I would just say, just leave. Leave with Hamas in place and then cash in the political bonus of that. I don't know if they can because they've vowed to destroy it, but that's something which seems to me possible outcome because Hamas is not a good uh, standard bearer, effective standard bearer for Palestinian nationalism. I think it's shown that uh, it's not politically adept in, in doing that. And Netanyahu knows that and they may still try to keep that in place mm. if they find that the work of taking it out, uprooting it is too much. Uh, continuing about Netanyahu, um, what are you hearing inside Israel? Like, Because we know he was extremely unpopular before the October 7th attacks. I imagine that much like post 9-11, the nation overwhelmingly probably rallied behind him, um, Israelis as a whole. But I, I imagine now after weeks of relentless bombing and the kind of PR disaster, let's say the world over that we're seeing, um, maybe not from Israeli allies, but just in general, right? Um, that's got to be hurting sort of morale within the country. Um, are you hearing anything? Because I think one of the things that you didn't mention just now when you were talking about sort of the, very, the, the sort of various or the calculus that Israel may pursue, what do you say about Netanyahu's political future uh, once the shelling, once the, you know, military campaign ends, if it does? 
Yeah, you know, Israelis uh, it seems are very different from Americans in the sense that when something bad happens in the United States, people tend to rally around the leader, uh, rally around the flag, per se, or to put it one way. I think Israelis seem to be quite different because they're quite mad at Netanyahu, actually. They're okay, not uh, looking yeah. to him as a pillar of support in what happened. His approval ratings have plummeted. And people blame him very, very much for what happened. Just for being a failure, because it said he's a security uh, candidate, that's what he said, sells himself as, and he did not deliver that. They were unhappy with him even before this for some other domestic political reason, Israel related to judicial reform. But now they're really, really mad because the one thing that he said he would do, which is you know, keep the country safe, uh, quote unquote, he failed at in a way that no Israeli leaders ever failed before, and it's directly the result of his policy of supporting Hamas and funneling money to Hamas. Uh, it blew up in his face and that many, many Israelis have paid the price for that. So they're quite mad at him. And he is almost certainly going to face an inquiry uh, at the end of this. He's already fighting to stay out of jail on corruption charges. So perversely, he has a strong personal incentive to keep his war going as long as possible. Yeah. Because the longer it goes on, the farther away his own reckoning is. And unfortunately, he's shown himself to be a very self-interested and craven politician in the sense that He's willing to put his own interest above the national interest. Even in his own crisis, you can see evidence of that in his behavior and his statements. So the longer the war goes on, the better it is for Netanyahu, uh, even if it's certainly worse for Palestinians and also worse for Israelis who are living in a very strange situation now where hundreds of thousands of them are displaced from their homes, living in other parts of the country, uh, and the economy and society is suffering quite a bit from that. So I think that while Netanyahu may be indifferent to the suffering of Palestinians in Gaza, it's going to be tough for him to continue ignoring the suffering of Israelis, who, to whom he's politically accountable. Uh, where do the other Arab uh, countries come in in terms of opening up their borders? Egypt, for example, uh, Jordan, of course. Are those going to be factors? You know, I don't think that they're going to open their borders for a very specific reason, which is... Uh, which has been said by the Egyptian government themselves, that if they were to open their borders, uh, they would effectively, like, let's say hypothetically, Egypt opens borders and then says any Palestinian wants to come from Gaza, Egypt can come. They're probably not going to come back. They'll never be able to get allowed back to their homes in Gaza because if you look at the history of the state of Israel and the conflict with Palestinians, that uh, no one's ever really been able to come back to their homes after they're expelled from them in, in large numbers. It's yeah. called the Nakba by Palestinians. And there have been several waves of it that have taken place. Uh, the Egyptian government, they've said this, they don't want the Israelis to be allowed to liquidate Palestine. And if they were to open the borders and the Israelis, what they would do is they'd make sure they push every Palestinian out of those borders. And then they would close the border yeah. such that they never came back again. And there were some leaked Israeli intelligence documents that advocated this uh, building tent cities in the Sinai Desert for Palestinians such that they would be relocated there per permanently while Israel annexed and repopulated the Gaza Strip. So, you know, this is being depicted as a humanitarian gesture by the U.S. and Israel. I think the U.S. given up on it now, but certainly by Israel. I think open humanitarian corridors for civilians to Egypt, that's actually an effort ethnic cleansing, an attempt to ethnically cleanse Palestinians from yeah, their land. I agree. Uh, one more time. Yeah. 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 It's no, it's really sad, but I, I, I kind of agree and quite nefarious. So just moving the conversation again for the sake of time, I, I know that you, you have a hard stop coming up. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, one thing we haven't touched on, and that is here domestically, is that generally speaking, the Muslim community has been pro-Biden, voted for Biden probably overwhelmingly in 2020 uh, because of what's happening in Gaza right now, that support wane, and, and that would be putting it mildly. Um, how do you see this sort of playing out in the upcoming election in 2024? Well, you know, I just look at this in the big picture a little bit, too. Because first of all, I totally understand why people are upset at Biden because he's not just been supportive of Israel. He's been very kind of cruel and insensitive almost in his statements. That's very, right. very indifferent uh, towards Palestinian suffering. And, you know, the sensitivity and the care, you know, warrantedly he's shown for Israeli civilians He's shown uh, not even a little bit for Palestinians. And I don't know why that's the case, because it costs you nothing to show 
even if you took the exact same policy, it means it costs you absolutely nothing to at least show some concern and compassion right. for the loss of Palestinian lives. Because, so, yeah, I completely, yeah, because in, in terms of policy, I was going to say, you know, you would be no different than any other U.S. president, but at least in rhetoric, right, you could be rhetoric, somewhere right, right. empathetic, somewhat empathetic. So, but yeah, that's exactly. been really shocking. I agree with you. It's, it's been strange. But I, what I would say is that, look, I will cover the Trump administration, uh, Israel, Palestine policies, Middle East policy. Uh, they're fanatically, fanatically anti-Israel, anti-Palestinian. Yeah. To a degree, we've never seen more than the average uh, U.S. administration, more than the Biden administration. I think if the Trump administration was in power right now, we'd be seeing even worse things in Gaza uh, taking place at the moment. Uh, and, you know, if you look at that, the reason is not maybe not because of Trump personally. He seems like kind of ambivalent and indifferent on the subject to some degree. But to the personnel that's around him, the people who are around him, are absolutely extremely pro-Israel and, and, and not pro-Israel, anti-Palestinian to a degree, which I'm, you know, I'm just flabbergasting. So if, he, if people were not vote for Biden, you know, Cornel West is not going to be elected. That's the reality. It's going to be the Republican candidate. And if it's Trump, which seems like it will be, you're going to strategically guarantee an even worse outcome for Palestinians. And Trump, don't forget, he is the one who gave uh, the Israelis the Jerusalem recognition, which took it off the table in a future ne- negotiation. He allowed them to annex the Golan Heights. He did so many uh, terrible things to set back the cause of Palestinian nationalism. And, you know, I can't really countenance or, you know, see the logic in uh, ensuring a victory for him if you care about Palestinians. I think that if I would look at the lesser evil, I'd still say, despite all Biden's terrible statements, he'd be the lesser evil. And I don't think about voting as an emotional thing or a self-actualization or, you know, speaking my truth per se. I just think, how do I try to strategically work with this, with the deck of cards I have and make it turn out as well as it can or as not poorly as it can? And I would have to say that, that if you care about Palestinians, it can't be ensuring the victory of someone who's fanatically against them, in this case, uh, President Trump. So, you know, I, I understand people's emotional reaction, but I hope that come November of next year, they'll think about it rationally. Maybe this war will be in the past, too, and there could be some uh, rebuilding of uh, ties and communication. Because, you know, when I think of uh, a politician you vote for, it's not someone who does everything you want, or even does most things you want. You think about which who is more likely to give you a hearing at least to hear you out and maybe do what you want and i think with the biden administration there's some positive pressure in the state department and in the bureaucracy people who are part of the progressive coalition who to whom they have to be to some degree accountable whereas in trump's case he's not accountable to people who like palestinians at all in fact he's accountable to people who hate palestinians that's yeah. his political his political coalition built on, on that basis that's, so yeah. I would see keeping them out as a priority. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think people forget. I mean, like, I'm sorry. When when Pompeo was 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 Secretary of State, we, we saw a, quite a significant shift in terms of you know the State Department and their relationship with Israel and a, a kind of anti anti Palestinian fervor that we had not seen. Even if we were to discount the sort of symbolic nature of moving the capital to Jerusalem, which other presidents have hinted at, but Trump actually quote unquote you know executed on. But the point is, like, I think, like you mentioned. That we saw during the Trump years. Is there any silver lining to all this? That can we can we possibly end on a on a positive note? And uh, it's not an ask. It's it's really just an honest question. Sure, sure. You know, it's very difficult. Uh, obviously, right now, what's happening? It's painful to see. Yeah, uh, the suffering of Palestinians uh, and some Israelis as well too in this conflict. I try to think of what's the best optimal solution of this at the end of it. Um, you know, certainly, like, the existence of Hamas has been really, really bad for Palestinians in the sense that it was specifically uh, divided the Palestinian national movement such that, you know, they could not have a unified state because the two wings of their prospective territory were at odds with each other. So, I don't know what's going to happen, but if it results in a unified Palestinian movement in one way or another at the end of this process, that would be positive. That could be actually something which is furthers the cause of Palestinian nationalism in the future. And on the Israeli side, you know, the government that's in place is the most extreme government they've ever had. 
And now the same government is responsible for one of the worst failures any Israeli government's ever experienced. Yeah. So what you can hope for is that this discredits the extreme right in Israel and that people take a lesson from this that, well, these people are not good at guaranteeing our, our security and we need a strategic security which can only come through political negotiations with our adversaries, in this case the Palestinians. So, you know, I hope that this process results in the discrediting of extremism uh, on all sides, per se. You know, is that really 100% going to happen? I'm not really sure, because I think in the Palestinian side, if you look uh, at these events, it's actually, it's been very positive for Hamas in a way, even if it's been bad for Palestinians as a whole, because they are the ones now who look very relevant to the Palestinian cause. They're fighting the Israeli army. They're resisting. Uh, whereas the Palestinian Authority is irrelevant and people don't even hear from them really. And this, they're almost invisible in this whole crisis. They're unable to resist the Israeli military's attacks in the West Bank on Palestinian civilians. So really, I would expect Hamas to start a rise out of this. So, you know, that's, they may be the, the ones who take over the Palestinian cause in the end. And it's not clear if they're the most effective at that. And on the Israeli side, it's also possible that the Israeli public will say the lesson we need to take is become more extreme, more right wing. You know, that could also happen. But I do hope, I do hope that both sides can, uh, this results in political discrediting of the more intransigent elements of their causes and a return to something more like the 90s when one way or another people weren't friends, at least they'd recognize that they had to deal with each other and they had to find a political compromise and solution. Otherwise, this bloodshed is going to continue forever. And I don't think anyone at this point wants to see more of that. Yeah, in light of what uh, everything that's going on, I, I, I almost want to end on that note. And because that is, at least there's some hope uh, that there is a silver lining here. Before we let you go, where can people find you? Where can people engage with you, your writings, etc.? Uh, anything else that you want to plug? If you have something forthcoming, tell our listeners about it. You can find me at The Intercept uh, right there. And then you can find me on Twitter as well, too. More, more to those things. It's nice to have at least a silver lining. Uh, it's definitely been uh, a tough couple of weeks. For sure. I mean, we're not, we're here thousands and thousands of miles away safe. It's definitely been uh, emotionally taking a toll. It was also helpful the last episode where um, uh, Professor McVeesey gave some context. I know that was helpful uh, yeah. even to some family members of mine uh, that, that uh, uh, you know, spent, spent an hour and a half just understanding the history that they didn't know. We'll we'll try to keep uh, talking about this as long as we need to, and uh, for sure. No, I I, I completely agree. Uh, it was nice to hear from Martha's. Uh, you know, we did a dive into the sort of landscape me media landscape. We haven't had enough of that conversation, but meanwhile, still sort of talking about it within what's happening right now in, in Palestine. You know, that, I think that was really important. Uh, yeah, we're gonna continue talking about this as much as we can, doing our part just to educate people. Uh, perhaps provide a perspective that people don't get to hear. Um, certainly delve into the history. You know, uh, Dr. McDesey was great at that. And we hope that we can have future guests who can uh, add some additional perspective as well. But as always, you can hit us up at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Check us out on our various social media platforms. If you like what you hear, please share it. And as always, if you want to support the work that we're doing, please go to patreon.com slash diffusecongruence. We look forward to hearing from you and you catch us again on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Thank <laughs> you.